Welcome back. We are in the middle of a problem, a mixing problem or a change in dilution of a liquid problem or as we have been calling them tank problems. The problem that we set up right at the end of class and we'll pick up from that point and then I'd like for us to do one more problem before we advance in the text is problem 36 from this sheet. It is a problem in the book. The air in a room with volume 180 cubic meters contains 0.15% carbon dioxide initially, so there's our time zero initial condition. Fresher air with 0.05% carbon dioxide flows into the room at a rate of 2 cubic meters per minute, and the mixed air flows out at the same rate. Find the percentage of carbon dioxide in the room as a function of time. What happens in the long run? So here's where we were at the end of class yesterday. We're letting C equal the amount of CO2 in the room. Uh, the rate of change of C is the rate of change of carbon dioxide in the room, dC over dt, is the rate at which carbon dioxide is coming in minus the rate at which it's going out. Uh, so the data from the problem, uh, fresher air with only 0.05% carbon dioxide flows into the room at a rate of two, 2 cubic meters per minute. So there's the concentration, getting rid of the percent, so it's 0.05%, so we've compensated for that. 2 cubic meters per minute, so this ought to sound like a rate at which carbon dioxide is coming into the room. So many cubic meters per minute, sounds like what we want. Um, Exiting at the same rate, what is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the room at any point in time t? There are c cubic meters. That's what c represented, the amount of CO2 in the room at any time t. c cubic meters of carbon dioxide equally dispersed in the whole volume of the room, which is 180 cubic meters, so there's the concentration. Issues or questions, because we kind of got that and then we were overtime yesterday and we left. Any issues with this differential equation? So let's do the numbers. 0. 0.0005 times 2 is what? Three zeros, two zeros and one, two zeros and one. minus C over 90. Uh, it is a differential equation, first order differential equation. Uh, it's got the derivative of C in it and it's got C itself in it, so it's got a first derivative, first order differential equation. Uh, what did we do at this stage of our second example yesterday? The first example, this piece was zero forget what it was, salt, something. There was zero salt coming in because it was fresh water. Okay, factor out the coefficient of C, uh, which I think was strange number. Th uh, 130 over 3, something like that, or 3 over 130. Anyway, so now it's 1 over 90, right? Doesn't have to happen, but I think you'll appreciate the fact that we do this now when we get to the um, integration of both sides. So if we factor out negative 1 over 90, we're going to have C. And what's the other term when we divide 0 0.001 by negative 1 over 90? What is it? 0 .09. 0 .09. Is that right? So we'd be, if we divide it by 1 over 90, we'd multiply it by 90. Is that correct? So 0 .09? Seems right, but that doesn't mean that it is right. So if you were to redistribute this, negative 1 over 90 times that, you'd be back here. Negative 1 over 90 times this, hopefully you're back here. So the next step is to separate. So 
So multiply both sides by dt. Kind of sends things in the direction they need to go. So we're, we've got dc's on the left side. We need to move our c's over there. We've got dt's on the right side. If we have any t's, we need to move them over there. So it looks like we need to divide by that. So the C's and the DC's are separate from the T's, which we don't have any in the DT's. So we should be able to integrate both sides. What's the integral of the left side? C minus 0.09. So you would say let U equal C minus 0.09. If that's true, DU equals DC. So we've got 1 over U DU here, so we're okay to do that. We've got a constant. We'll roll that to the right side. What's the integral of this right side? Negative 1 over 90 T. Put the two constants together. Uh, that's not a good constant, is it? Let's make that a K because we've got C's in the problem. So that's a K, strange looking K. What's next? Exponentiate. Exponentiate both sides. E to the natural log of something is that something. Uh, over here, we've got E to the, and this is going to be times E to the K. We've done that enough. E is a number, K is a number. There's no variables in there, so that's just another number, right? And we need to solve for B. What are the values given to us in the problem that allow us to solve for B? Time zero, let me read that statement. The air in a room with volume 180 cubic meters contains 0.15% carbon dioxide initially. So C is the amount of CO2. So how do we handle that? At time zero, is it 0 0.0015? Or is it 0 0.0015 times 180? Yeah. That one, right? That second thing? Because it's an amount. We want the amount. So how many cubic meters, not the percentage. So it's 0 0.0015 because it's 0.15% of the entire room, which is 180 cubic meters. So how many cubic meters of pure carbon dioxide do we have? Somebody tell me what that is. 0.27. So we'll plug those into this equation. All right. So the amount is 0.27 cubic meters. That's initially, that's at time zero. So e to the zero is one. So B is what? 0.18. So let's see if we've done what we're supposed to do. Find the percentage of carbon dioxide. So we have solved for C in the room as a function of time. I think we've done that. The only variable on the right side is t. 
uh, what happens in the long run. So I guess that means as t goes to infinity, what happens to this thing right here? So this would be e to the negative some huge number, right? Which would throw it to the denominator, so it's 1 over e to some huge number, which approaches 0. So this exponent, is that correct, approaches 0? Or e to this exponent e approaches to 0? E to the exponent approaches 0, which means that term approaches 0. So in the long run, it looks like c approaches 0 0.09. And there could be another part to this problem, which we've already looked at in another example, at t equals 60 minutes or 38 minutes or something, what is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the room? Questions on that? Yes? What did you say C approaches what? Zero? Or well, if not? this is approaching zero, then 0.18 times that disappears. So C approaches 0.09 in the long run as T approaches zero. Sorry, I didn't clarify that. Um, based on this problem, I don't know that we need to go all the way through this next example, but here's a, a type of uh, tank problem that is not a, a room filled with air and we want to con control the carbon dioxide, that's our tank, uh, or an actual physical tank. This particular tank is a lake. So our tank in here in this problem is a lake and we know approximately the volume of the lake and we've had a spill in the lake. 500 gallons of pesticide is accidentally spilled into a lake with volume 8 times 10 to the seventh gallons and uniformly mixes with the water. These are some assumptions that are made in this problem so this may not, the results that we get may not be kind of real world, but um, we're assuming that it kind of disperses fairly uniformly. A river flows into the lake bringing 10,000 gallons of fresh water per minute. We're assuming that the river doesn't have any pesticides of its own. Okay, again, another assumption. But, so we're, we're assuming that no pesticides are coming in and the uniform mixture flows out of the lake flows over the dam to the lake at the same rate. How long will it take to reduce the pesticide in the lake to a safe level of one part per billion? So safe to like water ski in or swim in or safe to drink. I don't know what safe is talking about, but under certain con conditions you would want to know what is either or. Safe to actually go in and swim, safe to actually drink the water. Say for you to drink it. I'm not going to be drinking it because I, I, I just don't have an affinity for pesticides. They don't, they don't work real well with me. I don't have a palate for pesticides. Um, this one, I can tell you a real world situation that has become very frustrating to me and maybe one of the Wake County Commissioners will be watching this cable telecast and, and actually do something about it. Um, my family and I like boating. We have a boat. Uh, we live three miles from Lake Wheeler, which is not a huge lake, but it's city of Raleigh Reservoir. Um, three years ago, I haven't been actually told what the circumstance is, but um, some kind of runoff comes into the lake. And so I would assume that we, if we'd have some, you know, kind of gully washing storms that as long as they fix the problem that was coming into the lake that you know a couple months go by you have a couple of big storms it washes it out it cleans it out three years later the lake is still not open for water sports uh, which is very annoying uh, so something is going on 
with that situation. Either the runoff itself with the heavy rains are bringing more pollutants into the lake, something is wrong and uh, it's not being fixed. So um, if you know anything about Lake Wheeler and the pollutants that are coming into Lake Wheeler in Raleigh, which is three miles from my home, uh, I would appreciate kind of knowing about that or even better yet, how about fixing it? How about fixing the problem, okay? Um, so we've got pesticide. Do what? Yeah. Yes. In bowling yesterday, um, we learned that you always round down. And so I told him that 0.9 repeat is the same as 1. Good. Good. And no, he didn't I'm going to get in trouble me. now, right? Yeah, he didn't believe me. He didn't. Okay, what's his name? I'll have to convince him. Coach Kidd. Kidd? Yeah, with okay. two Ds. All right. Yeah. Now, if it's just 0.9 or 0.99, I can't convince him because that's not true. But if I it said, is what if point it's 0.9 nine repeat, repeating. And he said, it still rounds down. There is and no I such said, thing as rounding down, by the way. Do you know what the proper term is? Since we're learning like proper terms, exponentiate both sides. It's proper. We want to be proper speakers of mathematics. What is it when you round down? Truncate. Truncate. So if you don't round up, rounding is rounding up. If you just ignore the decimals, then that's called truncation. We have to be proper. So if P is the amount of pesticide, then the rate of change of pesticide, the rate the pesticide is coming in, minus the rate the pesticide is going out. All right, so what do they tell us in the problem? the rate that the pesticide is coming in. Well, it says a river flows into the lake bringing 10,000 gallons of fresh water per minute. How much pesticide is that? Zero, right? So the concentration of pesticide is zero. It is kind of irrelevant. Um, that it's being brought in at a rate of 10,000 gallons per minute, but it's zero. It's flowing out at the same rate. What is the concentration of pesticide in the lake at any time T since it is changing? P is the amount of pesticide, right? Equally dispersed in the entire lake, which is eight, eight times 10 to the seventh gallons. So eight with seven zeros, is that right? So we've got actually one of the simpler types because the rate at which it's coming in is zero. So we've got just negative this term. That's better, similar to our first example. Um, the solution of this is going to be similar to what we've already done. But let's take a look at the, how we're going to answer the question. How long will it take to reduce the pesticide in the lake to a safe level of one part per billion? How do we handle that? Because how long will it take? We're searching for T. And then don't we have to put in capital P, which is not like one part per billion. Capital P is an amount, isn't it? An amount. So how do we do that? Wait. It would be P over the volume equals 
one times ten to the negative. Okay, six. that'll work. The amount of pesticide over the entire volume of the lake, right? Is one part per billion? Billion having how many zeros? Nine? So that's what we want to actually plug in. So that would be an amount of pesticide that we would want to know when it has been reduced to that amount, which is a ratio of one part per billion. So this value goes in here. Other than that, it's similar to examples we've already done. Question on that one? But we've looked at, I guess, kind of a typical tank problem that was a tank. We had brine coming into the tank. Um, we looked at a room full of air. That's our tank, and here's a lake that is representing a tank. So it could be a variety of things. Here's an oak barrel, previously held red wine. Okay, and the barrel probably still has some red wine soaked into the wood, and you want to run fresh water into it, and then how much of it remains after a period of time. So that is the tank. The tank is an oak barrel. I like our county commissioners. I, I really like them, and I, I and I like Lake Wheeler, and I like skiing and boating with my family um, probably more than I like my county commissioners. Okay, let's forge into Chapter 7, Section 4. My guess is that you already know a fair amount of situations dealing with exponential growth and decay, which is what this is about. I can hear the phone ringing from the, you know, it's not our jurisdiction, it's city of Raleigh. That's assuming that anybody actually watches this on cable TV, right? That's a, that's a huge assumption since we're talking about assumptions. So let's say that we have a, a statement about a growth rate. Let's say the rate of change of population so we'll assume the population is growing. DP over DT is directly proportional to the population at any point in time. Okay? So anything that is kind of growing or actually decaying exponentially would follow, follow this particular model. We've already done this in terms of a differential equation. But most of the time with these things, you can take the statement, we're going to do Newton's Law of Cooling in a moment, you can take a statement of Newton's Law of Cooling, take that English sentence, translate it into a mathematical sentence, which is an equation, that's all this is, and then do what needs to be done in terms of separable differential equations. So the rate of change of population is directly proportional to the population at any point in time. So we would multiply both sides by dt, not that we would do this, we have actually already done this, sorry, so we do the separating, the next thing we do is integrate both sides, the integral of 1 over p dp is natural log, natural log p. p, p is positive, it's population, Integral of k integrated with respect to t is kt. We do have a constant. 
exponentiate both sides. e to the natural log of p is p. This would be e to the kt times e to the c. e to the c is a number. I don't know that we went any further than this, but we could say at time zero, the population is typically referred to as p0, the initial population. And if we plug those things in, for p, we plug in p0. And for t, we plug in 0. Then it turns out that capital B is what? The, population. the initial population. So this equation becomes population at any time t is the initial population times e to the kt. So you've seen that mathematical model in a variety of versions. Uh, there's one kind of tailored to a population growth problem. Uh, you may have seen it written like this. You may have seen it written like that. That's something that's growing exponentially. And in fact, that something is what? For this particular model, where have you seen this model before? Compound interest? Continuously compound interest. In fact, we'll kind of derive that today, time permitting, um, from the kind of more generic compound interest. So continuously compounded interest, that would be the model. And that's anything that's growing exponentially. Um, everything, this is kind of the future amount or final amount. This is the principal amount, which is the initial amount of money. This is the interest rate, which is the same thing as the rate at which that thing is growing. Um, one thing that the author addresses here, let's go back to this. Let me at least make mention of this. Back to the original differential equation. Sometimes we call k the, the growth rate. Um, actually, if you solve this equation for k, you would get this. So k, Although sometimes it's called the growth rate, it's really probably better referred to as the relative growth rate. Because dp over dt is the rate of change of population with respect to time. So that's kind of the growth rate. But if you want to say what k is, k is kind of the relative growth rate. So it is based on the population at that point in time. So it's not just dp over dt, it's 1 over p times dp over dt. So your author makes an issue out of that, so probably it should be mentioned. k is not really technically the growth rate, it's the relative growth rate. And we're not talking about the number of cousins and aunts and uncles that you have, not those kind of relatives relative to the population at that particular point in time. All right, let's do a growth model. I actually had some great data when I was in D.C. Um, traveled with the Park Scholars on one of their learning labs to D.C. And this was given out at the um, basically the, the Fed, the Federal Reserve Building. It's got federal debt at the end of years 1940, and then it's got predictions up through 2013. And then the summary of receipts, and surpluses, and deficits from 1789 all the way up to what they're projected to be in 2013. I think some of this data is probably blown out of the water recently with uh, some bailouts and deficit spending. So to predict where we would be in 2010 or 12 or 13, probably not going to be a real good problem. But I'll hang on to this. Maybe it'll be 
valid at some point in time. I like real data. So here's some real data. So I decided to switch to this real data. So this is real data from the College Board. This is the cost of attending a public four-year college or university. And I am, have a son that's here right now, and so I'm right in the middle of uh, realizing the cost of attending a public four-year college or university. We don't. Did you think that faculty, like their kids, got a cut? They could come here for a reduced rate? No. no. So, legislators, if you're watching, <laughs> sorry, uh, but that would be a nice little perk, uh, you know, to let our children come here at a reduced rate. That's what somebody was telling me earlier. I didn't really personally think that, but uh, that would be. At home or like that. I know. If you work there, your kids go there. Right. Free. That'd be nice. Where do you Where are you from? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I like Pennsylvania. <laughs> so if, um, our high schools are like that. Oh, because you had a private high school. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have yeah. private yes. colleges in North Carolina that have reciprocating agreements like that. That's Actually, Davidson. Only your third child goes for you to get to you. Third child. I only had two. Whatever. Oh, God. Uh -huh. um, but that'd be neat, just to you know, see free books you know, or free tuition or something like that would be a nice perk for university uh, faculty. All right, so let's use some data. Let's take uh, this data from 95-96. Let's call this 95 data. And let's take another data point. So this will be our time zero, our initial data, because that's what we're starting our clock in this particular point in time in this chart. And let's go to four years later. So we're going 95 to 99. So if we're calling this 95 data and this 99 data, this would be time four, right? Four years after our initial data point. So we're going to use this model. It's not population, so I won't use capital P. So our two data points, time zero, and time four. I'll call it y sub four. We won't actually salt, put it in like that. but. So can't we just plug in Y0 into the mathematical model, right? The exponential growth model. So we're assuming that it's growing exponentially. That doesn't mean that it's like really rapidly growing, but it could be, you know, fairly gently growing, but it still is exponential in nature. So we'll plug that in for Y0. So once that's plugged in for Y0, then we go to our second data point. And if we plug in our second data point, what's that going to allow us to solve for? Okay. okay. So the new Y value So we'll plug in t equals 4, and the new Y value, the new cost of attending a public four-year college or university. And now we want to solve for k. So we divide both sides by. De exponentiating. We're actually going to de exponentiate it sometime. We call that something else. Okay. Because if you de exponentiate, what are you actually doing? Taking the natural log of both sides. Is there a verb for that? Yeah, I don't know if there's a verb for that. Natural we got to. We got to come up with something. Login. Okay. Login. I don't know. Think, be creative and come up with a new name. But we do, when we have our variable in the exponent position, we've got to get it out of there somehow. So that would be taking the natural log of both sides. And because natural log and and raising 
e to the x are inverse functions of one another. That's why this works so nicely. So the natural log of e to some power is in fact that power, right? Isn't that what you're looking for when you're looking for the natural log? You're looking for the power you would raise e to get that? There's a little understood e there. So what power would you raise e to get e to the 4k? That's a self-answering question. You would raise e to the 4k to get e to the 4k. Divide both sides by 4. And we'll fire up our little machines. Take that quotient, take the natural log of it, divide that by 4. This should be a growth problem, so we should expect k to be positive, right? k is positive, which the amount of money in this table is growing as we work our way down the table. So we would expect it to be positive. What is k? Now, it's not k for all of this data, but it's k for the two data points that we looked at. 0 0.045. 0 0.045? Truncated or rounded? Truncated. Truncated. And I don't know. It kind of depends on the problem. Uh, we'll do a decay problem that I think we'll have to get to the seventh or eighth decimal place to actually get some meaningful data. So it kind of depends on what you're talking about. So we would take this now back up to our model. So y equals So this table went up to 2005. It was, we're using the left number, so up to 2005. So let's predict the cost of attending a public four-year college or university. Again, there are some problems or assumptions with this. We use two data points. They may not be in line with the rest of the data points. So using the two that we have, predict the cost in 2009. So 2009 would be T equals what for us? Would Time zero was 1995, so 14. So this is basically a button pushing problem from this point. So the cost, if we use this model and assume that it's exponential growth, what would that be? 16? 16,000? I don't know. I'm guessing. 12,700. 12,000? 12,700. Mm -hmm. Roughly? How do you think we did? Let me show you the chart again. And I just, I just picked out some values. I didn't pick them out ahead of time. So according to this, in 05, it's already 12.1. So we used data from several years ago. Maybe the growth rate has increased. Kind of looks like it did from here to here, right? A little more rapidly than what we found over this four-year stretch. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a guessing game. Which data do you use to help you predict? So it might be a little underestimate based on what we see as real data from 2005. But it's, truthfully, it's not that far off from what I'm paying this year. I think it's probably about 14. So it's not you know, ridiculously that far off. Okay, um, I have a decay problem. I think we probably have time for that. And we've really got the rest of the week to do this section and all the examples that are in it. So we've got, uh, here's what we have yet to do. We have uh, exponential decay. We'll do one of those, at least as much of it as we can. Then we'll go to Newton's Law of Cooling, which has its own statement, which has its own differential equation. And then we'll go to uh, continuously compounded interest. Um, 
actually, let's switch the order up. Let's not. Okay, let's do this one. This is a decay problem because it has half-life in it. So something is decaying over time as opposed to the money being paid out to the colleges was growing as the table went down. So this is a carbon dating problem. So if you're like me, kind of geeky math major in college, this was the only kind of dating that I could actually get was carbon dating. <laughs> So um, it has, it's especially meaningful to me, that, um, it, which kind of reminds me if a couple of you uh, met my wife. And, you know, I'm thinking, I look at her, and she's just so pretty. I'm thinking, what were you thinking, you know, me and you? I mean, gosh, was it just like a bad day for you? Um, <laughs> bad week, maybe a bad, you know, couple of months, just having trouble seeing. So carbon dating brings back some good memories. Um, so radioactive uh, carbon-14, C-14, has a half-life of 5,750 years. That's why this particular element is used to date things. So what's half-life mean? It loses half its mass. Okay, how long it takes this thing that we're talking about, this element, this isotope, to decay into half of what it was originally. So if you started with 100 grams of this nasty stuff, 5,750 years later, it has decomposed to 50 grams. So this is a very slow decay rate. Because it's so slow, that's why it's useful in carbon dating. Now, carbon dating has its flaws as well. If you read an article in a science magazine or a journal, and it says, using carbon dating, we have determined that the age of this, whatever it is, is 10 billion years old. Probably not meant for that purpose because we don't know what the atmosphere was like, uh, you know, several hundred thousand years ago if in fact the planet was even in existence then. So this, if you get something to be several thousand years old, that's probably pretty valid with this technique but hundreds of millions or billions of years old, not, this is not a good technique for that. So C14, half-life of 5750. So we're going to have a, a problem to deal with here, but the percentage of carbon-14 present in the remains of plants and animals can be used to determine age. Archaeologists found, okay, that, so our real problem starts right there. So let's see if we can find out what K is for this stuff, C14. So we don't know how much we're going to start with. Let's call it Y0. We do know that 5,750 years later, this original sample of Y0 has decayed or decomposed to one half of Y0. So you don't have to know what you start with. You can make it up if you want to. You can say we started with 100 and it decomposed to 50, and it still works. But if you divide both sides by Y0, that's gone. So we'll take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of e to a power is that power. Doesn't look like a negative number, but the natural log of 1 half is a negative number. So we'll divide that by 5750. And I can't remember the number of zeros, but you get a certain amount of zeros, five zeros, and then negative one, two, oh, five, or? Negative one point two times ten to the negative. Negative four? Okay, so three zeros. One, two, oh, five? Yeah. And actually, that may not be enough decimal places to keep for K, depending on the level of accuracy that you want. 
But now we know in our particular model for this stuff, C14, there is the decay rate. So it's decaying very, very slowly. All right, so back to the problem. So that works for any problem that deals with carbon-14. Archaeologists found that the linen wrapping from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found about late 40s, I think, 1947, somewhere in there, right around 1950, uh, along the shore in a cave up along the shores of the Dead Sea, so the linen wrapping from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls had lost 22.3% of its carbon-14. How old was the linen wrapping? So we will assume that this linen wrapping was used to wrap the Dead Sea Scrolls right after the plant that made from which they made the linen wrapping was actually harvested. So originally it had 100% of its carbon-14 because very soon after it ceased to be a living plant it was made into the linen wrapping. So originally it had 100%. We're looking for how old this is. It had lost 22.3%. I don't want to put 22.3 here. So I want to know how much it still had. So if it had lost 22.3, it still had 77.7. So it had gone from 100% of its C14 to 77%. So 100% is... One, so I'll just leave that out. And 77.7% .7 would be that. We're out of time today. We got it set up. We'll pick up from this point on this problem tomorrow. <laughs>